This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we are back. We're live and we're honored to have Michael Davis among us again. He's been with us by Skype many times and he's been in the studio too and he yeah. flies around the world and he's, he's kind of a nascent intellect going everywhere, doing everything, but mostly about Asia yeah. and about, about Hong Kong and now also India. So let me try to do a kind of introduction if I could, Michael. Okay. Well, welcome to the show first. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> So we, we met him, and he was a local boy. I love yeah, that. Yeah. Um, we met him in, in his role at the Hong Kong, Hong Kong University, yeah, yeah. where he was also involved in the media. Yeah. And we talked to him about the umbrella movement and all the things that were going on mm -hmm. in Hong Kong uh, in the last few years. Um, but at some point, he left Hong Kong, yeah. although he had retained all kinds of strings, and he still has his yeah. radio show in Hong Kong, and he's a fellow at Hong Kong University. Mm -hmm. Some things keep going and going. Um, and he went to Washington, wasn't it, at first? Yes, the, uh, the National Endowment for Democracy. Okay, this is very important. Yeah. And then, and then he got connected with Notre Dame, where he is involved in Asian law there, yeah, and, yeah. or rather uh, yeah. Asian, Asian politics. politics and international right. issues. Yeah. And then uh, with Jindal University in India, which is a, a, a university that was established by one very wealthy person who yeah. sort of created it in whole cloth immediately. Yeah. And now it is a splendid place, yeah. and, and Michael is involved on the faculty there. Yeah. So the question is, uh, what do you like best? I, it's hard to say. I like Hawaii the best, I have to say. <laughs> That's why I'm here for a month during the holidays every year. My kids have been here every year of their, their childhood. So, and I was a lawyer for Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation years ago, so I'm very much involved in this community. But uh, I, I enjoy those other places as well. They're very challenging. Hong Kong is the most challenging city on the planet. And uh, India is probably the most challenging country. So <laughs> I'm having a good time. We have a correspondent, by the way, in Varanasi. Oh, there you yeah, go. Near the, near the northern border there. There you go. He talks to us about the issues that come across. He's a student. And well, uh, I visit the north of India a lot because I also work on the Tibet issue. So I, I oh, yeah. just came from a big meeting a couple months ago in, in Dharamshala in the north of India where yeah. the Tibetans are, are trying to figure out what to do next. Yeah, what, what, what sort of vitamin pills do you take, Michael? Uh, no, never mind. I get up and run every morning <laughs> trying to keep, keep to wake up each section of my body. <laughs> so you've specialized in, in law, in human rights, in constitutional evolution. Yeah. You specialized in things Asian, yeah. um, and this is really important because uh, you know whether the pivot actually happened or not doesn't matter. Yeah. The fact is that Asia is more important in our world now than it ever was, yeah. and you're right on that, and I envy you that because you're current on all these things that happen in Asia, including sea changes, which yeah. we really have to watch. And you wrote an article in October, uh, and you entitled the article, and I switched it for this, this yeah. show. It was entitled Strengthening Constitutionalism in yeah. Asia. And that's in the I, Journal of Democracy. Journal of Democracy. Yeah. And in fact, you were, when you, yeah, when you went to uh, Washington, you were the National Endowment for Democracy. So for you, it's all about democracy. Yeah. I changed that to include human rights because you're so yeah. involved in human yeah. rights as you have been. So, so the title of this show is Strengthening Constitutionalism and Human Rights in Asia in the Journal. Well, from the article. To be in the honest, journal. that was one of the earlier titles of that article. Is that right? <laughs> there you go. We struck something there. <laughs> there you go, Jay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'd like to know um, where where you are these days. I mean, intellectually, in terms of teaching and writing, uh, what what are you covering and what are you saying? Well, the biggest thing I've been doing for years, and, and something I really appreciate uh, from actually, I worked on ConCon in Hawaii many years ago. Sort of Constitution of Hawaii. It's about yeah. time to have another one. That's right. Well, I did that many years ago, and I've always found that human rights violations are local and solutions tend to be local. And so I tend to view a democracy and human rights through the prism of constitutionalism, and I think that's the challenge for us. That's the challenge that when I was in Washington, I met with a lot of think tanks and tried to encourage them to pay attention to constitutionalism not to break down the things they spend their money on and invest in into too many small pieces, but to see the bigger picture. And so that's what I do. I teach courses on what I call constitutionalism in emerging states. Mm. Uh, and I teach courses on international human rights and so on. So I, 
I see these two things as intimately tied together. Yeah, well, I'm, 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 I'm thinking at first that constitutionalism really means the rule of law. Am I right, or is it more than just the rule of law? Well, it's certainly at, the, at its heart is the rule of law. The idea that, that even the leaders are subject to the law and the courts have a role in upholding that in different systems that's done in different ways. But at the end of the day, you're looking for independent institutions that can oversee the processes of democracy. Uh, democracy is a messy business, so yes. we want to have you institutions. Talk, and you can use the word tumultuous if you wish. Yes, very good. <laughs> and, and so we want institutions that, that lend stability to democratic processes. If we don't have them, they tend to fail. And this is one of the big problems. This is what I'm writing about in this article that we see in Asia, that the institutions that are required haven't been there in many cases, or they've been undermined by expediency in many cases. And this is something we should all care about because most of the wars that we've been involved in have arisen out of these problems. So we all pay a price if yeah. we don't pay attention. The, the world has shrunk and we're all together on this and we yes. have to look at how uh, our leaders uh, engage these issues or not and, yes. and judging their performance. Oh, this sounds like something that's happening right here at home in the United yes, States, doesn't right. it? Yeah, it is. But I mean, you know, the suggestion by your comments is that this is a worldwide process. It's not just Asia, right. although we can see Asia as a laboratory for certain kinds of right. countries, cultures, and constitutions. Yes. Um, but in fact, it tracks together with things happening all over. Yeah. Right. And so the, uh, this uh, Foa and Monk is the two surnames of uh, a pair of writers mid last year wrote in the Journal of Democracy about the retreat of liberal democracy in the West. You know, the Journal of Democracy is often paying attention to the developing world, but th in this case, they're turning toward, in looking in the mirror and noting how many young people in our country who have never experienced the age of the Cold War and communism versus freedom and all of that don't quite understand the importance of these institutions. And so opinion polls have shown, in fact, among millennials in the West, 17% of them thought military rule would be better than democracy. Ooh, scary. I mean, and it's, it's not that they really understand what they're saying in that case, and, and they, they've not seen that up close and personal. But at the end of the day, they see democracy's messiness, and, and they see a kind of cynicism towards Washington, perhaps in their parents and their, their neighborhood and their community. And so democracy is not delivering and democracy is not for us. And of course, we're seeing some of that in our elections as well, yes. in how people turn towards more extreme pol politicians uh, and a polarization of politics. And Asia, like you say, is a microcosm of this. Uh, the same things are occurring across that region. A region is generally in, in present day considered one of the more economically developed regions of the world is experiencing some of the same problems. Well, two things come to my mind, at least for the United States, as to why, why we have lost touch with, um, you know, the elements of democracy that, that, that were there earlier, mm -hmm. after World War II, for example. Mm -hmm. One is we haven't taught our students about it. We haven't exposed them to civics and the elements of the social contract that, that yeah. makes democracy possible. Mm -hmm. um, the other is we haven't given them a role vis-a-vis -vis government. Right. There's no draft. They pay their taxes and hate it. They follow the regulations, go through a bureaucracy and hate it. They become completely distanced from government and anything to do when they wind up, you know, feeling the system isn't treating them right. I wonder, and so that's kind of a given these days. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming from your nodding that you, you agree with that. Yeah. But I'm, I'm wondering if the same kind of process happens in Asia. Exactly. In fact, in the article, I think you wrote my introduction that uh, there's sort of two sides to this. One is whether you have the institutional map right, that's the Constitution itself, and the second is the level of commitment to, to, to the processes and institutions that, that you've created in this constitutional process. And, and lately, I think, in many cases, for example, in Thailand, under Shinawat, uh, the 1997 Constitution in Thailand was one of the most liberal in Asia. And everybody thought, well, this is going to work greatly. But then all they got was a populist leader who sort of turned it all to his own cause. And, and we see that there's a lack of commitment to the kinds of institutions that that constitution, which was the best one they had had, uh, 
contained. And so the result is, of course, Shinawad goes wild and does everything he wants to do and kills drug dealers, just like Duterte is today. And uh, eventually you have these protests on the streets and, and the military swoops down and you have a coup d'etat and military rule, martial law. And more or less the same thing continuing to this day in Thailand. These so, things could happen here. Yeah, that's right. So th this is something that I think people need to understand. Now, it was interesting. Years ago, I was asked in Hong Kong uh, I, to give a talk to the education department to teachers. And they, um, the talk was to be how to promote the basic law, which is sort of the constitution of Hong Kong. And they was expecting me to, you know, go through the language of the thing and talk about it in some boring way. And I said, no, no, no. Get your students out on the street. Get them involved in actually making these things happen. Now, little did I know by 2014, there'd be so many of them out on the street with that umbrellas they, and have, that. With umbrellas <laughs> that they would be orchestrating an umbrella movement. Yeah. But that's, in a sense, how government works. It sometimes it's, it's based on popular action of the people who are guardians of, of their institutions. And other times, in normal times, uh, those institutions themselves provide the sort of engine of, of a democracy. So th this is the thing. Students can be taught it in class, but sometimes engaging it is also important. It strikes me, as so many things come to mind from what you say, it strikes me that, you know, democracy has seen the low-hanging fruit, that the people who organized the democratic nations and, and institutions early on had no idea how things would evolve. Yeah. Uh, and for example, I point out the social media, I yeah. point out the internet, I point out the mm -hmm. immediate communication among millions and hundreds of millions of people like that. Yeah. This has got to change democracy. It's got to change the way people react. It's got to change the way mm -hmm. leaders can affect you know, our daily lives uh, and our sense of uh, connection with the government. Um, so we are now in a different, don't you agree, a new kind of world where democracy has to evolve with all the other new things. Right. That and, and it's interesting, it sort of cuts two ways. Many people saw the internet as really reaching out, a web of communication to all people, creating a broader community of discourse. And so view, this is viewed very positively. And when I was on the streets of Hong Kong in the early stages of the umbrella movement, it was interesting how the internet was being used to bring people anywhere they wanted to get one of them in terms of the protests that were unfolding. And I, th I thought it was amazing to watch this. I actually wrote an article, a book chapter on, on this, on how the internet and social media were used in, in the umbrella movement. And, and so th and that becomes a very positive case of mobilizing people. So pe police are gassing people somewhere, you know, out goes all the messages and we're being gassed and in comes all the people to support the students that are protesting. But the other side of it is, is this kind of, I call the bubble phenomenon, that people become politically isolated in these bubbles of information. And I think we've seen a lot of that in this country, which has divided the right and the left. I think the right in particular has been prone to this kind of uh, certain sources of news and then certain interactions from Breitbart to Fox News where, where they never hear any of the other side of the story. You and I may have grown up in the day when there were three networks and you turn on Walter Cronkite or Dan Rather or something and you'll hear, you know, different sides of a story. Yes. But that kind of, that's been diminished. So how we can uh, make the Internet serve us. And I, I have a feeling Big Brother can't jump in and solve this problem, that we have to solve the problem, that we have to have a kind of consciousness within our community that causes people to try to understand what other people are saying and doing and different sides of a story. I don't see a way around that because the alternative is to silence those speakers, and that's also a problem. Yeah. Are we further away from, you know, um, good service to and through the Internet because of these uh, uh, diminishing the net neutrality rules uh, right. this week? That, that makes it possible for fewer to run it, few, fewer to control it, and for... The ordinary people in the tumultuous prospect process of, of democracy don't have as much as say. Likewise, um, the efforts in this country anyway to put power in the hands of the wealthy and take power away from everybody else, doesn't that put us further away from good democracy? Right. Well, of course, uh, the Citizens United case in the Supreme Court was something that had a major impact on how our politics 
have been conducted, especially in the last presidential election and the, and the huge amount of money spent. And every country across Asia has various rules on this. Some don't even allow campaigning until near the end, right before the election. So they, there's various kinds of ways to sort of diminish the, the, the role of money uh, in all of this. But yeah, it, it, it's, it's a problem. How, how you can have elections and so on where people are, are given information and we have this whole fake news phenomenon going on. And across Asia, the same kinds of problems occur. And, and, do, they, do they copy us? I, I mean, for I, example, the term fake yeah. news, is that used oh, in Oh, that Asian? language is used. Now. Oh, things how interesting. Things are described as yeah, fake yeah. news. So sometimes the things we do, uh, you know, take on legs and start going beyond <laughs> where, where we are. I was a fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy under a fellowship that was involving social activists. So I'm, I'm, academics are among them, but you're sort of an academic who's a social activist. And one of the social activists in my case was a woman from Thailand who run, ran a blog, a, a social media thing. And what happened was someone got on her blog and said something that violated the laws, what's called les majesté, the laws against saying something negative about uh, the king. Uh, and so she, as the owner of that social media uh, page, was arrested and sentenced to eight months in jail. Wow. So this idea that, that the, I don't know if the social media organizations really want to buy into what they've just got. They may have a pyrrhic victory here because they may come to own if they don't block people from saying things that are, that are somehow illegal. Get to be responsible. They may be responsible for it because they, they can't claim, no, 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 we're neutral. We don't have anything to do with it. That's that guy just using Facebook. Then suddenly, well, if Facebook is responsible for what's on Facebook, we're A, we're going to encourage censorship. That's going to encourage censorship by, by private individuals. But at the same time, it's going to encourage holding private individuals responsible as this young woman in Thailand found herself. It's all in process. It's all in play, Michael. Yes. Everything is in play these mm -hmm. days. And we're going to take a moment of neutrality now. <laughs> we're going to have a one minute break. We'll be totally neutral. You'll see. We'll be back. <laughs> My friend, mother, what big eyes you have. She said, all the better to see you with, my dear. What are you doing? Okay, cool. Research says reading from birth accelerates the baby's brain development. And you're doing that now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the starting line. Push. Uh, uh, when this is over, you're dead. Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. Hi guys, it's RB Kelly. I'm your host of Out of the Comfort Zone, where I find cool people with cool solutions to problems that all of us face. Now, the thing is, we're really cool, and I only invite really cool people, but the thing is, I think you're kind of cool too, so I think you should come and watch. That Thursdays at 11 a.m. here on OC16 Television with Think Tech Hawaii. I'm RB Kelly, host of Out of the Comfort Zone, and I will see you next Thursday. We're soaring, we're flying with Michael Davis. <laughs> we're bringing the world together. But let's talk about Asia, because that's yeah. his primary beat. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about constitutional evolution in Asia. What countries are doing well, what countries are not doing so well, mm -hmm. and why? Well, uh, of course, where I have my feet on the ground and spent a lot of the last summer in, in Hong Kong and in marches over the death of the Nobel laureate Liu Xiaobo and protest over the arrest of student activists and so on. What in Hong Kong, this is the one case where sort of democracy intersects with hardline authoritarianism. And the Chinese leaders don't like the democracy side of that. They don't like the open society uh, that's in Hong Kong and these youngsters that are taken to the streets and first as holding umbrellas and now continue their protest. Uh, Beijing seems to be uh, mopping up. And, arresting them and they've been some of them a bunch of them got elected to the legislature and were thrown the out Ch yeah and and so they oh you mean the the uh, the activists the activists yeah they were oh. elected and then beijing they were giving oaths that annoyed beijing the oaths they were saying something bad about beijing so then that was used as an excuse to expel them so six of them were expelled and then three of them were arrested for their march their protest activities and and 
They were sentenced to community service, and then the Beijing kind of nudged the government, no, that's not enough. Uh, and so the government appealed the sentence, and then they were sentenced to six to eight months in jail for protesting. Oh, it's got worse. Uh, yeah, it got worse. Oh, my goodness. And, and so these things are all going on, and now Beijing officials are lecturing Hong Kong that they have to enact these national security laws. You know, anything about my history, I was one of nine people who, in, the, was in, uh, years, uh, in 2003, we formed the Article 23 Concern Group. Article 23 is an article in the basic law that says Hong Kong must enact on its own laws on secrecy, national security, sedition, subversion, and so on. Separate from right. Beijing. And in 2003, the government came up with a proposed legislation, and the nine of us, uh, seven lawyers and two academics, uh, myself being one of the latter, we formed this group and we wrote pamphlets and distributed them on the street. Uh, we wrote nine pamphlets, each of us wrote one. We distributed a half a million of them on the street and then we wound up with a half a million protesters against the, the government's uh, proposed law, legislation and it was withdrawn. So ever since then, the governments of Hong Kong have said, no, 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 we're not gonna stay away from this. We don't want this kind of trouble. And now Beijing doesn't like the fact that some of these youngsters are advocating independence. So now Beijing... Independence from China. From China, yes. Wow. So now Beijing is saying, oh, you have to enact these laws. And they've given lectures to uh, the new uh, chief executive that they've selected. That they don't really elect them democratically. And they've given her the, the riot act. You know, you have to try to pass this kind of legislation. And so that's the big issue in Hong Kong today because the general sense is that today could even be worse than 2003 because Beijing may not, when we protested, we actually got the government to change and amend a lot of the language of the law before it was withdrawn because the government lost the, uh, the votes it needed in, in the legislature. But now some people say, well, if you're gonna do it, you should take up the draft we had and improve it. But Beijing may not be in mind to do that. So, so this is one place, Hong Kong, the sort of New York of Asia, is in the middle of a constitutional battle over basically free speech of people. Is it, yeah. is it a violation? Yeah. Is it, should it be a crime to advocate peacefully independence or to use that word or describe what you need as independence? Should people be put in jail I for thought that? one of the big, the big principles of Hong Kong was free speech. And right. when you and I first started having yeah. our discussions, yeah. I was so pleased to find that no matter what else was going on in Hong Kong, there was free speech in the newspaper, on the radio. You, you were in the middle of right. that. And, but I sense now, and I, I think I asked you at the time, what's the general direction here? What's the sea right. change? Because we know that Beijing doesn't like it, right. but be criticized, and they got a right. plan ultimately to control more and more of what goes on in Hong Kong. So what is the sea change on that? Well, see, that's the problem for them, because what happens, and this is across Asia generally in the world, when governments, it's kind of, I call it Newton's law, when you put pressure one way, there's going to be resistance. Uh, and the, Beijing, in a sense, uh, Hong Kong was almost, a, let, let's put a footnote here, Hong Kong was almost apolitical, you know, 30 years ago. People didn't really have much interest in politics. They'd been living under colonial rule. And so as they have this freedom, more freedom and, and open society, the more Beijing interferes, the more they push back. And so the radicals promoting independence, there's no serious support for that. But... This is a consequence of Beijing's own actions. Yeah, right. And so the more they try to contain people, and now to use Article 23 legislation to do so, it's just going to cause pushback from the people they're trying to contain. So uh, it, there was a poster during the, um, right after the umbrella mill, about a year later, when these, the independence movement only started a year later, and uh, when these guys were talking about independence, and it showed the chief executive of Hong Kong at the time, C.Y. Lung, as the father of the independence movement, because these guys that are doing this are actually causing, you know. You're right, it's a reverse twist. Yeah, state-created <laughs> protests. Protests yeah, yeah. in the world generally are state-created. Yeah. We, we, we only mobilized a half a million people, not because we're so clever over Article 23 at the time. We mobilized them because the government behaved so badly in response to what we were doing. If they hadn't been so, uh, you know, uh, dismissive, we probably could never have mobilized uh, that kind I of support. I suggest the United States could so, learn a lot from yeah. watching that process. Right, so it's state-driven. <laughs> and then if you look at that, so there's, there's Hong Kong sort of at the heart of Asia, 
where the base of CNN is at and news media and uh, information flows from Hong Kong. And then across the region, there's been th problems. You know, the Philippines, you got Duterte. There's a constitutional crisis in full bloom there. Killing people. Yeah, he's killing people. He doesn't random, give a damn. You're talking about the, the importance of... No due process. Yeah, separation of powers, liberal institutions, forget it. Uh, the parliament, the legislative body could be a check, but the way the Philippines finances, the money that president controls, generally when a guy wins the office, then everybody flocks to support him because they yeah. want largesse from it. Yeah. So there's no real serious resistance in the legislative body. There's street activists, many of whom I've trained because I was teaching human rights in Hong Kong for many years. Uh, they're out there protesting, but you know they get arrested and so on. And Duterte could care less about all of this. And even foreign criticism, as Obama discovered, isn't welcome, right? Uh, and and Trump is only too happy not to criticize Duterte, and so yeah. that that they're buddies. So it's a huge moral decline in here. Yeah, we we kind of wonder in Asia whether uh, Duterte is the Trump of Asia or whether Trump is the Duterte of America. <laughs> Jury's out. <laughs> That's right. So, so this is the problem we face. And then if we go across and we look at in Thailand, of course, we know that Thailand was one of the most vigorous new democracies in Asia. Uh, and they, as I, I think you and I discussed earlier, they wrote this 1997 constitution, which was Wonderful. It was the most liberal, most democratic constitution in the region. Then they proceeded to elect a guy like Duterte and Trump, who proceeded to unravel it and use his power to, to do things that were not very mindful of human rights in the constitution. That was a Shinawat, and he's out of power now. He, there was a coup d'etat that took him down. And then his it's all, it's sis, all destabilizing. Yeah, his sister got in power, and she got taken down as well. And so there's military rule there. Now the military's come up with a constitution that's pseudo-democratic. Uh, it promises elections. They're now under an interim constitution, which privileges the military endlessly. Uh, and then this new one was created, which was to go in force in 2017. Now it's pushed back to 2018. And it essentially provides a uh, continuation of martial law until a cabinet is put in place, you know. Once a cabinet is put in place, which the government, the military government is so easy at delaying, then, then that constitution will operate. But it, there's a lot of criticism, and I've written about it in this article, The Journal of Democracy. So there's another one. And then uh, Myanmar, of course, 2008 constitution. Terrible. Again, the military writing the constitution. But there was sort of in a liberal trend, liberalizing trend. Aung San Suu Kyi. Yeah, and they allowed for elections. The first time they allowed elections and lost, they, they arrested everybody. Second time, they figured they, they, they will live with it because they really wanted support from the West and business and trade. You know, they're the poor man of Asia. So they did what they had to do. And Aung San Suu Kyi's party won, I think, 391 out of 490 seats. Uh, and, and a quarter of the seats were already guaranteed to the military in the, in the parliament. So, so that one is not very democratic, and the military retains control over defense, foreign affairs, uh, and, and uh, no, homeland affairs, and border affairs. So the Rohingya problem we, we've been watching in the news is pretty much all under the control of the military. The only question about Aung San Suu Kyi, which she's gaining a lot of heat for, whether she speaks up, but she's sort of in a political crossfire there is a lot of, uh, shall we say, very little support, let's put it that way, for the Rohingya among the uh, Buddhist population uh, of, of An old entity. Right, yeah, it's old stuff. They view them as Bengalis from Bangladesh, a neighboring country, although many of them are, have lived in, in uh, that border region of Myanmar for uh, generations. Yeah. So they're not, really. But that, that's sort of the argument that, that, that's made popularly and Buddhist monks even get in this business of organizing very uh, anti-Muslim uh, ways. It's terrible what's happening yeah. there. Terrible. And so what, she's sort of at a, a dilemma. If she speaks out as everybody wants her to forcefully, then she may lose political support and the military would be only too happy to do that. So she's sort of got her whole democracy thing on the table on one hand and these values. And, and we don't know what her own views are as, as herself. She's Burman whether what her own views actually are on this. Uh, but, but I think she's extremely cautious, and this is, is, has been very disturbing. 
yeah. to many people who have supported her for generations. We only have a minute left, yeah. but doesn't this last question, doesn't this all suggest that in the complexity of our, our times um, and current you know, developments and sea changes, not only in Asia, mm -hmm. but in the world, it has become more difficult to be a good and effective, a moral, ethical, democratic leader. And we can't seem to find them, put them in office, empower them, support them, and be in a social contract with them. And this is a threat to the world. No? Yeah, and I think this is why in this article, and your audience is welcome to read it, it's in the Journal of Democracy, October issue, I've promoted seven principles that I think are, I think are helpful. They're not solutions. There's no easy fix. Only authoritarian leaders have easy fixes. But these are principles that I think can help people to understand how democracy works and, and what things might be important uh, in forming a democracy. And on that basis, I think we can get leadership we like. Uh, even the U.S. system assumes that we could have scoundrels in the White House, but it has the institutional uh, equipment to deal with that. You know? And I think that's kind of what we're looking for. We don't need a savior, but we need a system of governance that works. And, and, and it's never going to be perfect, but it, it, it will be much better if the population is engaged in the process. Thank you so much. Michael Davis, it's great to talk to you, and I hope we can get you back here soon. There's so much more to cover. Absolutely. Aloha.